I'd like to now introduce our next speaker. Dr. Christopher Ball is assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame in the Department of Anthropology. He teaches and writes in the areas of language in culture, the political economy of language in society, ritual performance, possession and exchange, Amazonian development, discourse and power, dialect and multilingualism, relationality and alterity, grammatical categories in mind, the anthropology of space and place, indigeneity and language shift. We have much to learn from Dr. Ball. Please welcome him. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, a project that, uh, a collaborative project that I've begun just last year with Wauja people of central Brazil. I've been working in the Wauja community since I did doctoral dissertation fieldwork there in 2005 and 2006. And we've just launched this uh, new project, which is very much a work in progress, only recently underway, in which the goal is to um, use contemporary technology to map traditional knowledge. So I've changed the title uh, for what's in the program slightly um, to Mapping Indigenous Ethnohistory and Ecological Knowledge. And I've chosen this image um, to display on the opening sli slide because as you'll see, the project is primarily focused on water and in particular um, on uh, rivers. Um, and so one of the objectives uh, that I and Wauja people have in this project is um, co making connections between uh, language, indigenous language practices, especially uh, what we might call ethno-historical narrative, uh, and the riverscape. So seeing how the um, river and uh, the riverine environment is coterminous and co-constructive with Wauja peoples um, speaking um, in and about places. So a little background about um, Wauja people. They live here primarily in this community. The Wauja is spelled W-A-U-J-A. -A. Can you see that here? And uh, this is um, their primary village, although they now have expanded um, and have villages um, down, or rather upriver. The, Sh the Shingu River is here, and it flows north into the Amazon, which cuts across here. So the Shingu is a major tributary of the Amazon, and the river on which Wauja people live is the Batovi River, their traditional territory, um, and it's a tributary of the Shingu. So two steps rem removed from the Amazon proper. So as I was saying, Wauja people live primarily in this community, but have established um, new communities uh, upstream here and um, on another tributary that isn't visible on this map um, over here. But again, this is the primary um, community. So Wauja live in uh, central Brazil, so this is Brazil here, and the territory in which they reside is a demarcated national park called the Xingu Indigenous Park. The park was founded in the 1950s um, by the Brazilian government um, with the intention that it would serve as protected uh, uh, territory for a number of indigenous groups that uh, live within its borders. So you can see the Wauja community is only, only one of many named settlements here, almost all of which um, are inhabited by people who share cultural and historical ties but speak different languages. So as a linguistic anthropologist, um, one of the things that drew me uh, to this area was the fact that there are multiple languages spoken uh, in the region. And even though those languages many times are mutually unintelligible, people have intense um, exchange relationships and historical understandings um, with one another. So the community is a very interesting one taken as a whole because um, it is um, brought together largely through ritual practices. And I'll be speaking a little bit about, um, about that in just a minute to give you an example. So Wauja people reside mainly in this village. Uh, the village is called Piulaga. 
while Wauja people have strong attachments to the land and to the forest surrounding their village, um, they use the forest um, to farm manioc, often called yucca in uh, English, which is the staple starch. Um, and also they have um, pequi fruit orchards. I don't know any translation for pequi. It's a really interesting fruit that's um, native to central Brazil. It's kind of like a cross between a mango and an avocado, if you can imagine that. Um, and the fruit is um, uh, grown in traditional orchards which are, which are owned by the family. And so people move in the forest a lot, um, both for um, farming manioc and for tending their fruit orchards. But one thing that people in this region, in the upper Xingu region, um, the lower part of the Xingu Indigenous Park, where, as I mentioned, people um, speak different languages but share cultural practi practices and historical connections, one thing that people don't do so much in the forest in this region is hunt. The reason why they don't hunt is because their um, protein uh, is primarily based in fish. So to get fish, people move more along the river. Um, and so I'll be talking about the river from, from now on. And before I move on, I'll say one thing. I'm going to be showing some images and talking about um, Wauja people's practices on rivers. And one thing you'll notice in looking at the pictures is that they primarily show men. And while in the village um, I work um, and collaborate with both men and women, while the village is a female gendered domestic space, uh, the river is traditionally a male gendered space. And so it's men who go on the river to, to fish. And so that explains in part the bias that you'll see in this presentation. So rivers are foundationally important in Awauja uh, history. This is a depiction drawn by um, uh, uh, a storyteller named Aruta who passed away last year, and it depicts the four levels of the cosmos. This is Kehote, which is the earth, and then above the earth you have three further levels. This is the level of Kama, sun, um, where the villages of uh, ancestors are located, so people who die um, rise to um, be near the sun. This is the level of Keshe, moon, um, where the stars are also located. And this level here, the intermediary level between sun and moon and earth, is um, the Milky Way. Yet in Wauja, Milky Way is not um, conceived quite the way uh, we think of it. The Milky Way is, in fact, a river. So here you see the um, Artist has drawn in blue the Milky Way as a river, and you can see the canoes and the otters and the, oh, sorry, this is the otter and the fish that live uh, in the Milky Way. So rivers for Wauja people are concrete spaces in the environment, but they're also a reflection of the celestial river, which is reflected in, in, in mythological um, narrative. So water is fundamentally important, and rivers are fundamentally important to Wauja life. People bathe in rivers. People modify rivers. Here the, there's a, a, a fish weir that's been constructed at the confluence of two rivers uh, at a location called Wakanuma, which controls the flow of fish um, um, from larger rivers into the, the, the smaller streams that feed it. People navigate rivers using uh, traditional wooden canoes. And people also navigate rivers using metal boats. And when Wauja people move on the river, they attune their bodies to the rhythms and the flows of the waterways. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is describe as just an example of people's engagement with uh, the river environment, I'd like to describe a particular a series of events that um, I was um, fortunate to be a part of uh, just last month um, in the Wauja community. So as part of the ritual connections that establish relationships between Wauja people and their neighbors, um, they hosted a kwarup, or in Wauja, kaumai ceremony in August. Um, 
in which, to which they invited hundreds of representatives of nearby groups to participate in a funeral honoring um, the Wauja uh, older and some younger people who had passed away in the previous year. I mentioned Aruta, who drew the depiction of the uh, four levels of the cosmos passed away, and he was one of the people who was honored this past month in the Wauja ceremony. And one of the consequences of having a large intergroup ceremony uh, to which you invite hundreds of visitors is that you need to feed them. And so before, a few days before um, people are due to arrive, Wauja folks gather um, on the river near their village and engage in a collective fishing expedition. And the goal is to get as much fish as you possibly can, which will be smoked and then distributed to the visitors when they arrive. So this collective fishing expedition is at once a moment where Wauja people come together and engage in, um, in group activity that um, connects them to their specific environment, and yet it's also the first pass in a, an outreach, a gift, an exchange with their neighbors um, with whom collectively they'll mourn their ancestors. So the night before the fishing expedition, um, young men and, and, and elders gather near the river. They stay up all night. And one of the prerequisites for entering the water to fish is um, that men be pure. It's said that the fish will, and the spirits of the fish will smell a human presence. And one of the ways in which people in the night before going into the water um, rid themselves of, the, of their human distinctiveness is uh, through purification by fire. I was also subject to this. That's me. And at dawn, before going fishing, men will also paint themselves with charcoal, which is another way to um, mask their humanness, and so not repel the fish. You can also see in this image, at least in some cases, the men have um, painted their calves with um, a medicine that um, prevents the fish from being scared by their presence in the water. So once they're ready and prepared, slightly after dawn, they enter the water in a large line carrying this fishing net. Some of the men also accompany um, in canoes. The idea is to create a large circle um, of men holding nets, men in canoes um, and boats, and to slowly tighten the circle, um, capturing the fish in the middle um, as they get closer and closer to the far shore of the river. They use a, um, a, a special medicinal tree bark that it, when dunked in the water and repeatedly hit with a stick, releases not a toxin, but um, a chemical into the water that deoxygenates uh, the water in, around it and um, raises the fish to the surface so they'll be more easily captured. By the time the circle really closes tightly, um, it's a bit of a free-for-all, and men with nets um, are gathering large numbers of fish and putting them into the boats. By the time they approximate the shore, um, people are grabbing fish with both hands, and sometimes, as in the case of my friend Wahicha here, uh, even with their teeth. Now I'd like to uh, move to um, the specific project that, I'm, uh, that I told you I was going to tell you about. And uh, before I give you some more details, let me just tell you the general parameters. Um, we had been talking for a long time uh, about what, would, what kinds of work, anthropological work, um, could be most beneficial to uh, Wauja cultural and political interests. And one of the things that um, came up again and again was the lack of um, a strict or detailed um, mapping of Wauja traditional territory. 
Waja folks live within the boundaries of a national park, and so to a certain extent, their environment and their um, territory, most of it anyway, has been protected for some uh, 50 plus years. But there are still um, central and foundational um, locations that Waja claim as part of their territory that are outside of the park. Um, and Waja people have been very focused in the past um, five years or so especially, really a decade, but it's, it's ramped up in the last five years, in making uh, the government aware of their claims to the territory that's outside of the park and, uh, and in attempting to get it demarcated. And this is work that continues. We'll have meetings in November when I return to Brazil to talk with government representatives, NGO representatives, um, and Wauja community members about furthering the process of demarcation of their, of their territory. But rather than focus only on the, um, the bit of territory that's outside of the park, we came collectively to the realization that really the thing to do is to map as much of Wauja territory, whether it's inside the park or not, as we can, in a way to establish continuity um, between the territory that they um, currently inhabit and the territory that their ancestors inhabited. Because the river, as it flows from south to north, provides a very real and a very visible picture of how Wauja territory extends back in time. So in our project, we decided that we would use GPS, audio and video, um, and photographic recording techniques to travel to the sites on the river and to um, record narratives of elders about the names, the meanings, and the histories of those places. We travel on the river in uh, motorboats, loaded up with camping equipment and food, and, and, uh, and the AV equipment I mentioned. Whoops. And we visit um, spaces, places that are um, described by, pointed out to us by the elders as important for one reason or another. We'll stop at those places, and elders will tell um, young people who come along with us um, about what happened in those, in those places and how Wauja people are related to those places. Wauja folks are um, doing video recording here, photography and audio recording, as well as GPS geotagging um, as we work together to um, record these histories. And I should say that all of the videography in this project is being done by uh, Wauja cameramen. I, I just take pictures and record in audio. Now, when we travel on the river and visit these sites, it's not just an opportunity for the elder narrators to tell um, children and teens uh, who accompany us about those places. It's also a real opportunity for young people in the community who are adults now um, to share with the elders how they understand the benefits and the possibilities of using technology. So Apo Singh here uh, has um, experience with GPS and GIS, and he explains to the older people what it is we're doing in terms that um, make it really a collaborative project across generations. The sites that we visit are important for, very, uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Some of them are places where people collect natural resources, like chili peppers here. Some of them are fishing sites where, um, where places are uh, recognized for, for, for being particularly good um, for fishing. This is a piranha. Some of the places are known for um, collection of other food products like turtles. And some of the places are known for being um, um, inhabited by uh, animals and, and, and spirit beings who reside in the environment. Now, I mentioned that Wauja people were motivated in part to engage in this project because there was a um, feeling that there hadn't been um, compiled yet a, a detailed enough um, 
map of Wauja history. One example uh, of, of a map that has been done is this one here. So in the early 2000s, an NGO that no longer works in the region had collaborated with Wauja folks on making this map. And, but Wauja saw several deficiencies in the way it was done, and this in part motivated um, the way in which we're doing our project now. So what basically happened in making this map was the NGO representative showed up with um, a cartographic map that was already um, prepared but blank and sat down in the village center with Wauja people and asked them to point to different places on the river, looking at the map, again, seat, seated in the middle of the village. And they wrote down the place names and they came up with a, a key here of symbols that show something about the site's importance, whether or not it's an old village, whether or not it is associated with resource, natural resource collection or with supernatural beings, et cetera. So this was a really interesting and, and very valuable first pass at mapping Wauja territory. But as I said, the Wauja found two deficiencies with it. One was that um, it wasn't precise. That is to say, it was done by memory without actually visiting the places. So while Wauja people remembered where the places were and were able to point to them more or less on the map, it wasn't um, it wasn't produced through actually going to and visiting the places, which has become so important in our travel on the river. As we get to the places, the elders who are count telling the stories become visibly excited about remembering um, the places in a way that they can't, and they'll tell me this, that they can't do when they're not there. So arriving at the place triggers a connection with the place, which opens up um, a portal to the past, which opens up a connection to the space, which generates the narratives that they tell, and the narratives they tell in turn regenerate connection to the place. So traveling on the river to make the map was a fundamental precondition of the project when we started to plan it. The other thing um, that um, Waja people found deficient in this map was that it does provide some indication of what's important about the place with the little symbols, but it doesn't have any depth to it. It's very superficial, so it doesn't have the actual story about the place. It doesn't have an actual image of the place uh, in the map. And they asked how we could work it in such a way that we could put that information directly in the map. Now, Wauja maps uh, of their traditional territory, like this one drawn by Itzau Taku, uh, show the village here, um, the, 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 the lake that uh, feeds uh, the river here. And regardless of the, the spatiality of it, that is to say, it looks different than the river looks when photographed from a satellite, one thing that we notice right away is that the presence of spirit beings throughout the landscape is very much front and center. And so in trying to think about how we could do these maps together, we, we, we thought that it would be very important to include this kind of information as well, to show the fact that for, um, for Wauja people, interaction with um, supernatural beings is a part of their um, experience of the river. So what we did was, last year, um, in our initial um, phase of data collection, we went out um, on the river and geotagged roughly 70 sites. So this is to give you a sense of just how many bends in the river we stopped at, just how many bends in the river are named, just how many bends in the river um, are recognized as traditional sites of either resource exploitation um, uh, or, or something else. Um, and there's lots more places to the south that we will be um, visiting in our next trips, both um, in November this year and again in May in 2017 and hopefully uh, in 2018 as well as we continue with this project. So after um, returning from the trip last summer, we were able to take the GPS data, which is just the um, satellite location of the spot where we stopped, um, and integrate that into a uh, GIS map database. And I'm working with one of our um, colleagues here at Notre Dame, Matt Sisk, who's been amazingly helpful in, in helping me learn about GIS um, and, how, and how this is possible. And so the idea is that you have a map here, which is a satellite image, 
you have all of the spots or some of the spots in this map because this is still just a mock-up um, indicated by different colored dots. And then by clicking on the um, dots, you can call up uh, images and videos of um, the, the, the narratives of those places. So let me um, give you an example of what the map looks like in its current form. So if you look at the map here, it's a little bit off center, but that's okay. And you click on this site, for example, you can see this image and you can see it um, precisely where it was recorded. This is just a track. This is all very much in progress, so we're trying to figure out how to best make it user friendly. But so far, the basic idea is already built in. By clicking on spots, you get uh, images and even recordings. So here, for example, is a site named Kuanapu, which we visited, and we recorded this video. I may have just froze it by trying to expand it. Let's do it again. Technolo technological Two. glitches are, I don't send. So one of my goals in the next year um, is continuing to work with Matt Sisk, who I mentioned is the GIS expert on the project, is um, also to collaborate with um, people from uh, our art and design department to figure out how to streamline this so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. Because basically what we have right now is we have a, a, a a program called ArcGIS, which is um, taking its time opening again after having just crashed, um, which is great for science, but not so great for interaction and education. And the idea, right, is that this map will be um, available to members of the community for use in the community. And so trying to figure out how we go from this stage where we have the map conceptualized and in a kind of clunky way operationalized now to an end product that in fact will be user friendly, beautiful, and will be easy for people to use in the village, um, that's, that's a real goal. So I mean, imagine the possibilities of um, young people with tablets in you know, the coming decades being able to travel to the spots on the river and using a GPS um, location call up the, the narratives that were, that were recorded during um, our visits to those places um, and hear them. That's what we're hoping to get. Bear with me one moment. No, that's the wrong one. There it is. Let me just try this one more time. Thanks for your patience. Katani, Weko, I tell me a wow, Kali. It took a tiahak, but in a blagati. So he's, re he's recounting the name of the place, and one of the, one of the interesting things that he says about it is that 
it's not traditionally a wowza place at all, actually. It's associated with an ethno-linguistic group which is um, extinct now, the Kutanatu. And so he's using the opportunity to visit this place to tell us the story of the history of the Kutanapu's demise. Let me just jump ahead slightly. So it turns out, as they're telling the story collectively um, together, it turns out that the, Kuana, the Kutanapu were um, notoriously known for witchcraft. And he's now demonstrating how they used to shoot witchcraft arrows at one another. There's an arrow. There's an arrow. There's an arrow. So he's describing how the Kutanapu were jealous of one another and how they uh, shot witchcraft arrows at one another. And this is why they're all gone now. What I find so interesting about this is that the visual element is absolutely necessary to understanding the narrative, to see him demonstrating how this action was carried out. Let me just stop it there. And I'll say this, the Wauja story about the Kutanapu um, having disappeared because they shot each other with witchcraft arrows is complemented by the, the kind of more um, uh, historical account that, in fact, the Kutanapu were wiped out by um, a smallpox epidemic after encounter with German explorers in the late 1800s. And when I ask Wauja people, well, which story is true? Were they killed by each other because they were witches, or were they killed by a disease because the German explorers brought smallpox? And Wauja people say, well, those versions are both entirely compatible. Um, they were subject and weak, let's say, um, um, subject to decimation by the illness because they were uh, prone to jealousy and witchcraft in the first place. So I find that a really interesting example of um, how Wajo people blend uh, historical and, and, um, and other kinds of local explanations. Now let me just um, finish by jumping ahead here. Here we are. Another goal of this project for me has been part of a larger exploration of the audiovisual representation of indigenous peoples in general, but also of Waja people in particular. That is to say, in this project, we're producing together a record of images and sounds that Waja people are intimately involved in the production of. Um, we're doing it together, so I'm producing images alongside of Wauja people who are producing images, et cetera. But this is actually something quite new. Wauja people have been photographed and um, been filmed for television for many, many years now. Um, one prominent recent example of Wauja images uh, that are circulating globally is in this book, Genesis, by Sebastian Salgado. Do people know the photographer Sebastian Salgado? Yeah? He is a Brazilian photographer who's now based in Paris for many decades. Um, and he's known for photojournalism primarily, but in his last project, which began in 2005, um, he decided that he wanted to document the beginnings of life on Earth by photographing elements of nature, animals, and natural environments alongside of um, indigenous people. So the book is a beautiful book, but it problematically represents indigenous people as though they were primeval. Um, and so I'm very interested in how that depiction becomes popularly received um, and what it says about um, kind of contemporary Euro-American understandings of, um, of indigenous people. So very briefly, I was um, doing dissertation field work in 2005 and 2006 when Salgado came. It just so happens that 
the few days he was in the village were exactly 10 years prior to the days on which the Waoja engaged in the collective fishing expedition that I showed you earlier. That is to say, Salgadu photographed the Waoja when they were doing a collective fishing expedition 10 years ago in 2006, precisely for the Khao Mai funeral ceremony that they were hosting that year. Uh, and this is a picture that he took um, uh, of me and one of my um, friends um, on that morning 10 years ago, juxtaposed with some of the images um, that appeared in the finished book of Waoja people as they participated in a traditional ritual. And one of the things that I point out in thinking and writing about how the circulation of these kinds of images can produce a biased understanding of the lives of contemporary Waoja people is that the photograph that he took that morning shows a normal scene where people are cold because it's early in the morning and so we're fully clothed. But all of the pictures of indigenous people in the book show them naked. This is one of the images that Salgado took in 2006 of this very same 10 years prior fishing expedition. And I think it's representative of the vision that he had for um, this work overall, which was to show indigenous peoples as existing at the time of Genesis. So here we see no elements of modern technology. We see only the wooden canoes, although in fact on all these fishing expeditions, people use man-made nets and metal boats and outboard motors and everything. In fact, Salgado, when he was photographing, asked people to take off their watches to take off their sandals, to take off their shorts so that they wouldn't appear in the image. And, and I'm writing about this now um, in a way that's um, respectful but critical of that kind of um, uh, a photographic practice. So one thing I did was I said, well, these images are out there. It's a very popular book. It's been reviewed in um, major news outlets with great acclaim. But I decided to take the book last year back to the Waoja community. Um, and I donated the book to the school and sat down with families. And we looked at the book and talked about Waoja reactions to it. And I tried to produce images of how Waoja people engage with the book, which show, in fact, that they're onlookers and viewers of their own images, not just depicted subjects in them. And Waoja reactions to the book were really interesting. Um, they thought the images were beautiful, but when they looked at the pictures of themselves, which you'll recall were largely when they were um, wearing body paint, feathers, um, and all the traditional adornments that, that are common to ritual, they didn't see themselves as naked, which a lot of Western and Euro-American viewers did. They saw themselves as fully clothed because they were adorned in um, their Sunday best. Another reaction that Waoja people had to the book was that it was important that they were represented as having a place in the natural world. Um, so they did absolutely recognize that the book highlighted their connection to their natural environment, and, and, that, was, and that was a positive thing. But there was another side effect with, or, or kind of interpretive um, element that I thought was very interesting, and that is that they recognized in the pictures of other Amazonian Indians and other indigenous peoples from Africa and Melanesia primarily, that those people looked to be less civilized than the Wauja. And so they were able to find in kind of the collection of images in the book their own place, and it was a privileged one. Um, and so in a way, I won't say ironically, but in a, in a, in a, in a at the end of a very complex pathway by which the book worked its way back into the community, um, people found a lot of value in their own depiction. Um, um, but at the same time, they were looking at the book in much the same way that Euro-American viewers were, I think, and that is in evaluating their relationship to people um, far away and supposedly removed in time from them in a way that was very thoughtful but also showed some cultural bias, which uh, we all have. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Pardon? Please do. Yes. You had talked about the language. Mm -hmm. There's a theory that indigenous languages are 
is truly stem from the local land, the mm -hmm. ancient land, flora, the fauna, etc. Yeah. And that the places where there's a diversity of languages, there's equally a diversity of different terrains in the British Columbia. Right. Can you speak to that theory from your experience? Well, yeah, for sure. My, um, my background in terms of my education is in linguistics and anthropology. And the, the, the linguistic history of South America is extremely complex. And um, Wauja, for example, speak a language which is um, recognized to be part of the Arawak language family, which is one of the widest spread families in, um, in the continent, along with Tupi and um, Carib. Um, and there are similarities between languages all the way up to Colombia and Venezuela down to the southern part of Brazil. So if you, so Wauja people have um, um, elements of the language that are similar to elements of languages spread out. So not, not unlike European um, languages. The diversity of the upper Xingu is attributed um, although we don't know a lot about the prehistory of the region because, um, because there hasn't been um, enough, let's say, archaeological research. Um, the diversity of the languages in the region is attributed to different um, migration patterns and um, the Wauja as Arawak speakers are described by linguistic historians as probably having been the one, among the first to have, to have arrived. Now, is that history incompatible with the idea that language emerges through um, people's relationships with specific places? Much like the idea expressed by Wauja people when I asked about the competing theories of the demise of the Kutanapu, um, I don't think it does at all. And in fact, this project is in part geared at reconciling some of those different views of the situation. So by paying attention to Wauja people's insistence um, on going to the places and telling the stories of the places in the places, I'm really keen to explore how the language is generated by those places and how the language in turn regenerates those places. And, and this is something that um, is, is for me, really, really interesting as a complementary kind of linguistic history from the one I was uh, taught in grad school, for example, right? And, and it's very clear that Wauja people connect to um, not just the places through recounting the stories, but through to their ancestors. So uh, Wauja narrators will often say, um, as a preface to an amendment or even a central part of the narrative about a place, who told them that story? probably their father, their grandfather, and establish a chain of connections down or back in time through generations to people who used to visit that space and through their own linguistic practice constituted that space. So there's a chain uh, of connections that I'm, I'm really actively trying to, to trace and to build into the map as a way to show Wauja perspectives using kind of a modern technology. So thank you for that question. Hi. Um, thank you so much. And just to grab that last thing you said about a chain of connect. One of the things that I was thinking about is would it be lovely if you were to incorporate the, their maps yeah. as an origin spot. So that's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Show that as well. And then a question kind of related to that. So looking at that single map that you showed us, mm -hmm. I, I know a little about your specialty, but I was thinking about an older book that um, Barry Lopez did. Mm. I think it was Arctic, was it Arctic Dreams? And um, he talked about mapping in there in one section, and he talked about the way that the Inuit people had maps that were quote unquote not to scale, right? because they showed their relationship and I was curious to what degree that might also be true. And if, if you looked at more maps and if you if 
had that sort of same um, experience, and then how that might, because I, I, I mean, I, I, see the, I see what you're doing, and I think it's really wonderful and lovely. I want to sort of have you pull in more of the uh, connection with their own, you know, origin of their own mapping. That's right. Um, and absolutely, our plans are to incorporate all kinds of um, locally produced images into the database. That is to say, to have those be clickable as well, right? So that those representations yeah, are, that would be great. are and part who of it. Who is but your primary audience? The primary audience in the first place is the Waja community. So this is, this is a digital product which will be um, proprietary. It is proprietary to the Waja community, and we've already started to talk about issues of access. So that there, uh, there, are, there are concerns about um, having um, certain elements and stories that are represented here not circulate outside of the Waja community for purposes because of, because of authorization to to know where certain places are, places where medicine is collected, et cetera. But just to say one more thing um, about your question, which I really appreciate, is in a way what we're trying to do is to combine this kind of universalizing cartographic view from a satellite, which in a way represents kind of the oppression of the state and the, 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 the cordoning off of people into discrete categories that are recognized because they're based in the Western episteme or epistemology of science, and then to supplement that with an on-the-ground view, which is really what the anthropological method of ethnography is all about, trying to show the view from the perspective of the people who move within those spaces so that we're complementing um, the traditional kind of closed and fixed delimiting function of a map in the traditional sense of cartography with a more fluid moving um, view from the ground or from the river actually yeah so that's a real goal that hopefully overall that that will emerge as we develop the the best ways to to make those two visions um, visible yeah. i would like to continue on that theme um, if we think of the uh, the ability to find these places and through the stories that are handed down, it's an inward bodily perceptive mm -hmm. map. You are the map. Uh, Eleanor McGuire's studies of London taxi cab drivers in the late 1990s yeah. showed the enlargement of the hippocampus uh, memory areas because of the vast knowledge they had. We also know hippocampus can be limited with Alzheimer's and also GPS. Uh, and one of the great questions today is the loss of a sense of place yeah in our society from the use of the GPS. So if you think of the GPS as the external map, uh, what's the, what do you see as the right balance for people? <clears throat> because it's very easy that you can, you can suck out that capacity and mm -hmm. practice, uh, uh, the connectedness through who tells you the story and all of that. Yeah. Uh, which is the better place to find? The, that place of storied memory or the precise place? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, um, the ideal of precision was something that was um, brought up in the early stages of discussing this project by Wauja people themselves. So the idea of precision isn't, isn't necessarily only our own. <laughs> that is to say, a, an outside one. Um, from the point of view of people in the community, I think there was a real desire to complement the precision that they feel in their ability to navigate those places with the precision of something like a satellite to mark the position of that place in relation to others on a map. And remember, I, I didn't emphasize this enough here, um, in a very real way, this is a, this is a highly political project that Wauja people are engaged in. And, and in terms of defending their territory and establishing a strong claim to their territory in their conversations with government and non-government representatives, people in the community are very aware that this kind of representation that is a cartographic one, even a technologically sophisticated one that's done through GIS, is more persuasive. Um, people would love to take government representatives in boats to all the places on the river and tell them again and again how grounded they are in these places and, and demonstrate through their narratives that they uh, own these places, but that's simply not 
going, it's not a practical means of defending their territory. And so this document, while it will be primarily um, used in the Waja community, is also, uh, it addresses very important political um, actors in the Brazilian national sphere. And uh, people hope that this kind of product will speak to them um, and convince them that, wow, there's real, continuity all along the river while your people have been living for a long time. And so when we go outside the park, just upriver, why does the territory stop? That, that doesn't seem right. But at the same time, as my colleague Matt Sisk, who's helping me do the maps, um, said in a, in a discussion we had last week, we're also trying to upset the linearity of the river. When you look at it on a map, it looks like a line. When you look at it from the perspective of traveling in a boat, it's more like a pathway. And, and, and so the both elements are in play, and I don't know where the balance is. And, and who will decide will be Wauja people themselves and how they want to represent their own vision of their space. Come and talk to Dr. Bull. Thank you.